Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the reaction video. My name is Paul. We're here with The War That Changed the English Language. Uh, I thought the uh, thumbnail was pretty funny. I think it had, like, beef, cow. Was it, like, the Battle of Hastings or the War of Hastings? I forget what the thumbnail looked like, but it was funny. And, uh, yeah, we're going to check it out. Uh, from Oversimplified, uh, definitely so far since I've been came back to uh, YouTube has definitely been my favorite channel. <laughs> I just love their videos. So you guys should definitely check them out too. But anyways, let's get to the reaction guys. And if you wouldn't mind, please hit that like and subscribe. That would be great. But let's get to the video. Video to learn how you can get your first two months. Yeah, by the way, like my, uh, my Renaissance shirt from Wish I got the other day. It definitely feels like I got it from Wish. Probably looks the same way. Feels cheap and looks cheap. Hey, you get what you pay for, right? It's all good. Do this. Wish has a lot of cool stuff. But anyways, uh, let's get this video. It's for free. England in the Middle Ages. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. The children are playing in the village square. What a wonderful time to be alive. Hey, you're dying of dysentery. And also we're being raided by Vikings. What an awful time to be alive. It's the year 900. Europe is a Vikings wet dream. Raids galore. Hey, you want to go raid Paris? Okay. That particular raid didn't go too well, but the King of the Franks said, you guys are pretty tough and scary. How about we give you land in northern France, and in return, you protect us from other Vikings. And it was agreed. The Vikings set up the Duchy of Normandy, and then they went full on French, converting to Christianity, learning the language, and making babies with the locals. England also had a... I'm sorry I'm pausing it, but with the, the Vikings, you know, failing against fr France and helping them out, that's just like, the, I don't know if you guys have seen the TV show, Vikings, from the History Channel. But that's pretty much kind of like exactly what happened. So I just thought that was interesting. Anyways. It's fair share of Viking problems. In the 800s, Danish Vikings had conquered most of the country. But the Anglo-Saxons eventually managed to kick them out. Although they left behind a bunch of Viking settlers. Now this guy's king. He sucks. Replace him with his brother. And he was like, hey baby, how you doing? And had a son. And then turned around and was like, hey baby, how you doing? And had another son. And then he died and no one was sure which son to make king. This one, because he's older. Not if I have anything to do with it. That works for us too. Then he grew up and married the Duke of Normandy's daughter and had a bunch of kids. Remember this one. He's important. Then his advisors came to him and said, Hey man, all those Viking settlers that are living here, they might band together and kill you. Well then, why don't we kill them first? And so it was. This pissed off the Danish king, who launched an invasion and the Vikings conquered England once again. Then the Anglo-Saxons wow. unconquered it, then the Vikings reconquered it. The king's family had to go into exile, including Edward. Remember him? He went to Normandy where he lived for 30 years. He and his brother Alfred tried to return to England to retake the throne from the Vikings, but they were betrayed by the Earl of Wessex who said, Hey friend, I'll take you to London where all the nobles are waiting to make you king. Oh no, look out, red hot poker in the eyes. I can't see. And thus you what? can't be king. Edward then escaped back to Normandy. After a few more Viking kings came and went, one finally died without an heir, and Edward was called back to England where he became king. And that's where our story begins. War Thunder. Okay, guys. Here's the thing about becoming a king in the Middle Ages. Often your entire country won't support you at first. You can be vulnerable to rebellions, and it's up to you to take control. Fortunately for Edward, there was already a super powerful guy who had a lot of control over England, and if Edward could get his support, then England would be his. Who is this guy? Oh, piss, it's the guy who gave my brother the red hot poker in the eyes. After an awkward moment where Edward exiled Godwin from the country, he eventually had to give in and let him keep his earldom, possibly after Godwin gave him a bunch of gold and said he was very, very sorry. King Edward also married Godwin's daughter. Then Godwin died and his massive fortune was passed down to his sons, who all became earls. In particular, this one became the new Earl of Wessex. Harold Godwinson was now King Edward's brother-in-law. He was a close advisor to the king, a brave warrior who had proven himself in battle against the Welsh, and in many ways he was almost like a co-king. Uh-oh, Edward got old and he's on his deathbed. Possibly for religious reasons, or maybe because he wasn't happy about having to marry her, he didn't boink his wife, and as a result has no kids, meaning there's no obvious heir to the throne, meaning I'm going to be king. He does have a grandnephew, it could be him. Mm, now let's go with me. Just one problem. I mentioned that Edward's mother was a Norman. Edward grew up in Normandy, and he had a lot of Norman friends. The current Duke of Normandy was William the Bastard. Why was he called the Bastard? One day, his father was sneaking out of his castle when his advisors said, Where are you going? Uh, to the tanner's shop. Why? To get a... Tan. 
<laughs> but that was a lie. Firstly, because tanners give you leather, not tans. And secondly, because he was really going to see the tanner's daughter. One thing leads to another, oh. and out comes baby William, born out of wedlock. Thus, an absolute bastard. His father died when William was seven or eight, and he became the new Duke. He spent most of his childhood narrowly avoiding assassination, which probably turned him into the big balls tough guy he's remembered as today. In 1051, the town of Alessant tried to rebel against him, and the townspeople beat on dead animal skins as an insult to his commoner mother. William was furious, and he responded by, well, let's just say it wasn't pretty. That's the kind of guy we're dealing with here. William and Edward were good friends, and Edward allegedly promised that William could have the English throne after him. A decade later, Harold Godwinson even visited William and pledged an oath to him over holy relics, promising that William could be the next king of England. Although it's possible Harold only did it because William was holding his family hostage. So when William heard that the king was on his deathbed, he said, hooray, I'm gonna be king. So now you have two extremely powerful men who both think they're about to become the next king. But wait, this guy is the king of Norway. He spent most of his life as a warrior for hire, fighting for whoever would give him the most gold. You name a place, he probably fought a war there. Poland? Yep. Estonia? Yep. Against pirates in the Mediterranean? Yep. The Holy Lands? Sicily? And Bulgaria? Yep. He got crazy rich off the back of it and was swimming in gold. Then he returned home and became king. One of the previous Norwegian kings had made an agreement with one of England's Viking kings, saying that when that Viking king died, the king of Norway would get the English throne. Hardrada felt that because of this agreement, he was now entitled to the English throne. He was also eager to go on one last big conquest that would turn him into a legend. So when he got word that Edward was on his deathbed, he thought, I'm going to invade England, and then I'm going to be king. So now we have three extremely powerful men who all think they're about to become the next king of England, and that means somebody's probably about to get hurt. Back in England, Harold Godwinson is watching over the dying king, Edward. Suddenly, he comes out with a shocking announcement. Hey, uh, everyone, gather in. That's it. Come Woo! closer. Don't be shy. Okay, right, so I've got uh, bad news. Guys, the king is dead. Back. Um, I know. Yeah. All right. Well, we're back. <laughs> On with the show. Very sad. Uh, but good news. He said that I should be the next king. So, hooray for me. And, um, oh yeah, he said that if he once told anyone else they could be king, that he doesn't like them anymore, and they should just stay in Normandy. And also he said that no one should ask. I wonder who's going to be king. I guess. I have no idea. I'm going with the bastard. Any further questions? Okay, good talk. Go, um, go do whatever it is you do. Usually it took months of preparation to crown a new king, but Harold rushed it and he had himself crowned the okay. same day King Edward was buried. In Normandy, William's advisors came to him and said, Hey Big Willie, bad news, Harold Godwinson has taken the English throne. And William was furious, so he sent an envoy to Harold who said, William says you stole the throne and demands you immediately return it to him. Hmm, let me think about that. <laughs> no. No. He said no. That bastard. Wait, I thought you were the bastard. Dude. <laughs> Uncool. All right, and we got another war. <laughs> William immediately began gathering his armies together and preparing for an invasion of England. Now, killing a king was generally frowned upon in old-timey Europe because they were considered to have been chosen by God himself. So back in Normandy, William had to get God on his side. He needed the Pope's blessing for his conquest. So he went to the Pope and said, Godwinson made an oath to me over holy relics, and then he usurped the throne. Can I kill him? Eh. Sure, why not? <laughs> so the Pope gave William his blessing, meaning William now had God on his side. Everything was ready to go. Just one problem. The wind. It was blowing the wrong way, and William had to wait with his army in Normandy, while Godwinson waited with his army in the south of England. They waited, and waited, and waited, and then William said screw it and sailed for England and got shipwrecked because the wind was blowing the wrong way. So then he decided to keep on waiting. They waited for two months and the wind never changed. Eventually Godwinson got bored and also ran out of food for his soldiers. So he sent them all home and he returned to London. The south coast was undefended and all William could do was keep waiting. <laughs> While the northerly wind kept William in Normandy, it was carrying Hardrada and his Viking army to England. Uh -oh. Hardrada landed near the old Viking city of York and defeated a regional army led by the northern earls and York surrendered. When Godwinson heard about this, he must have been pretty upset. He had just disbanded his army, and now he had to gather them all together again and march all the way north. He made the exhausting journey in just four days, which is crazy quick, and he caught the Vikings off guard and unprepared for battle. The two armies stood on either side of the River Derwent. Legend says that a berserker Viking single-handedly held the only bridge crossing the river, dodging arrows and fending off attackers, what? until some English soldiers got under the bridge in a barrel and gave him the old spear in the jewels. 
This gave the Vikings Ooh. enough time to form a shield wall, but because they'd been caught off guard, many weren't wearing their chainmail and armor, and the English eventually defeated them, killing Hardrada, and with him, bringing the Viking era in England to an end. Still waiting. Maybe I was wrong with that prediction. <laughs> Finally. William's fleet of over 700 ships and 14,000 men wait, set wait, sail wait. and landed on the English coast at Pevensey and set up camp near Hastings. And Harold was still all the way in York. His exhausted army had to march all the way south just days after their battle with the Vikings. Harold made it to London and considered just staying there and waiting for William to come to him. But William forced Harold's hand by burning down a bunch of villages. Harold's army set out and met Williams on the 14th of October, 1066. And both sides prepared themselves for the Battle of Hastings. The English were on a hill, so they decided to stay there because it was a good defensive position. The Normans approached, and the two sides probably spent a while yelling at each other. William and the Normans had a few tactical advantages over the English. The first were the archers. The Normans sent volley after volley of arrows at the English, who formed a shield wall in defense. Then William sent his infantry up the hill. The English threw anything they had at them, and the Normans couldn't break through the shield wall. Then the Normans' next tactical advantage came into play. William sent his cavalry up the hill, but even they struggled to break through the shield wall defenses. Wave after wave of infantry and cavalry came, and Harold knew all he had to do was let the Normans exhaust themselves, and he would win. But then something a bit strange happened. It's possible the Normans incorrectly believed William had been killed. Maybe they lost their will to fight against the shield wall, or maybe it was an intentional deception tactic. But suddenly, the Norman forces turned and ran away from the English. Believing they had won, the English broke their shield wall and chased down the retreating Normans, who then turned around, encircled the English troops, and cut them down. In the chaotic fighting that followed, Harold Godwinson was killed, the most popular theory being that he took an arrow in the eye. The English were defeated, and William had won. He was no more just a bastard. Now, he was a conqueror. At first, right. the English nobles were reluctant right. to make him king, but William burned down a few more maybe, villages, maybe and the nobles eventually gave in and offered him the crown. As he was coronated, the local villagers in Westminster let out a cheer of support. But William thought it was a riot, so he burned down the village. William then had to go on a long and costly campaign of quelling rebellions and burning down villages all over England to force the people into submission. And England went through a massive transformation under its new Norman rule. English nobles were replaced with Normans. They built castles and grand cathedrals, but one of the most interesting changes occurred within the English language. The Normans brought their dialect of French to England, and it merged with Old English in ways we still live with today. First of all, the Normans were obviously the ones in power, so words related to power like government, judge, castle, and crown come from the Normans. Normans. Words that are considered posher or more refined are usually the Norman ones. At first, the Anglo-Saxons huh. probably weren't that friendly to the Normans, while the Normans likely weren't that amiable towards the Anglo-Saxons. An Anglo-Saxon might come into a room, but a Norman would enter into a chamber. An Anglo-Saxon might buy themselves a shirt, while a Norman would purchase a blouse. And while that filthy peasant's new shirt may be fair, the Norman blouse is absolutely beautiful. The Normans actually considered some Anglo-Saxon words so crude that I can't even say them on YouTube. But there's more. Ask an Anglo-Saxon what job he does, and he might respond with some low-level trade, such as a baker, a miller, or a shoemaker. But a Norman has a skilled trade, like a painter, a tailor, or a merchant. The Anglo-Saxon farmers working in the fields owned many cows, pigs, and sheep. But once they were served up in a Norman banquet, they became beef, pork, and mutton. And written English changed too. Since many Anglo-Saxons couldn't write, the written language was romanticized. Your annoying friend that says cool whip might just be speaking an old English dialect, as the Anglo-Saxons originally wrote it when, where, and what. But the Normans swapped the W and H around, and the long English oh. A vowel sounded more like an O to the Normans. So you can thank them that you live in a home, not a ham. Hey. Yeah, that's interesting. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to... Interesting. Fun fact about William, the man couldn't read or write, not in French, not in English, not in anything. Well, what if I told you there was a place where you could learn French, English, even Japanese if you wanted. And not just that. Pick up a musical instrument, learn to code games and apps, animation, photography and film, anything you could dream of. All taught by genuine experts, and you can get your first two months for free, I'm talking about Skillshare. With over 17,000 classes in the arts, business, technology, and more. I get a lot of comments asking how I create these videos, and the answer is a mixture of After Effects, Photoshop, and Illustrator. You can find classes for oh, okay, all okay. skill Sorry. levels on Skillshare. I was, Sorry, I, was, I wasn't sure if there was, uh, that was one of those like ads that got stuck in the middle, like very clever ads that get stuck in the middle of the video. But, okay, Battle of Hastings. My, my guy won. I picked uh, picked William to win. He won. So, won nothing for me. But, anyway, it's interesting. It, it's very interesting, you know, to see, you know, where the language comes from and why we call certain things, you know, like that. Because, yeah, just cool, good stuff. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, it was definitely a funny video and definitely, definitely, definitely learn something. Like I do all the time when I watch these videos. Because... A lot of stuff I don't know. Anyways, peace. Please hit that like and subscribe, guys. Appreciate you guys watching. 
I uh, hope you're having a great new year and yeah, peace. See you next time.